Today on the John Ankerberg Show, many Christians expect Jesus to return in their lifetime. Why? Because Jesus promised, I will come again and receive you unto myself. At the rapture, the Apostle Paul writes, Christians will be caught up from the earth or raptured to meet Christ in the air and to travel with him to his Father's house in heaven. But at Christ's second coming, different events happen. The Bible says Jesus will come all the way down to planet Earth where his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will rescue believers and usher them into his millennial kingdom on Earth. What are the eight differences the Bible teaches will occur at the rapture that will not happen at the second coming? And what are the eight different things that will happen at the second coming that will not occur at the rapture? My guests today are Dr. Renal Showers, widely recognized as one of the most distinguished theologians in America and author of numerous books. My second guest is international journalist and prophecy scholar, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, who has lived and worked in the Middle East for over 20 years. He will report on how events in our world today are rapidly leading toward the events the ancient Jewish prophets predicted will come about in the last days. We invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We're talking about the rapture, we're talking about the tribulation period, and we're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ to earth. Now, maybe you haven't heard these topics before, and this sounds really funny to you. These are biblical topics, and we are representing what the Bible says to you. And you can look at it yourselves, and you can decide. God has spoken in Scripture. If you don't believe that, fine. But the fact is, for those of you that do, then we need to take these words seriously. And we are taking them seriously, and there's a, a question that arises in relationship to this thing called the rapture and the second coming. The rapture is when Christ leaves heaven, comes to a, the air above the earth, and snatches, catches away, raptures every Christian who is living at that moment on planet earth up into the air and takes them all to heaven, and planet earth has no Christians at that point. Second coming is a different series of events where Christ comes with those that he's raptured, that have been in heaven for seven years and comes at the end of the tribulation period and he comes to defeat his enemies, to rule and to reign. Now a lot of people think that the rapture and the second coming are just one and the same event. That Jesus comes, raptures the church, we meet him in the air and we come right straight back to earth or other versions of that. What we're trying to say is that they are two separate events and we're saying what is the biblical evidence for that? We said there's eight differences and we've given those differences there's a difference, number one, in the place Christ will meet believers. At the rapture, Christians will meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, the Bible says Christ descends to earth and steps onto the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Number two, there's a difference in who removes people from the earth. We saw in the rapture verses, Christ himself comes and takes believers out of the world. Whereas at the second coming, all those verses say Christ sends his angels to take the wicked to judgment. The third one that we've already looked at is that there's a difference in those who are taken from the earth and those who are left. The Bible says that at the rapture, Christ comes and takes believers, unbelievers are left. At the second coming, the believers stay going to the millennial kingdom and the wicked are taken out of the world and taken to judgment. Fourth one we've looked at, there's a difference of when Jesus comes in relationship to the tribulation. At the rapture, Jesus comes before the hour of trial. And at the second coming, he comes after the tribulation. Now today, we've got a very interesting difference. This is the fifth one. Dr. Showers, the Bible indicates that there is a difference in the number of signs that are given for each event. Take the rapture, okay? There are absolutely no signs, the Bible says, that have to take place before the rapture can occur. And the key verse is 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. Paul says to the Thessalonians, you know, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait 
for his son from heaven. That wait for, the Greek word is anamenein, okay, to wait up patiently for Jesus from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, and he's the one who delivers us, he rescues us from the wrath to come. Whereas at the second coming, we're going to see that Matthew 24 says, before Jesus can come, I'm going to give you a whole list of signs. But first of all, talk about the rapture, that there's no signs that have to take place before that event. Yeah, and, and that verse 2 in 1 Thessalonians, it's a Greek present tense, which means continuously, that the Thessalonian Christians believed that Christ could come at any moment, so they were continuously uh, waiting, continuously waiting for Him to come, which said that uh, Paul apparently had taught them you can't count on something else having to appear before Jesus comes to take you to be out of the world. Whereas by contrast, when you look at what the Scriptures say, uh, what's leading up to the second coming of Christ back to planet Earth, you're going to have a revived Roman Empire formed, you're going to have a world dictator, the Antichrist come to take control uh, of things here upon planet Earth, and you're going to have uh, wars and uh, pestilences and, and all the rest taking place before Christ comes out of heaven down to planet Earth in the second coming. And so there are many, many, many things that must take place according to the Bible before the second coming of Christ coming back to get rid of Satan's rule from the world system and restore God's theocratic kingdom rule back to planet Earth again. Yeah, let me give you another one. James says, hey, do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge, the Lord Jesus, is standing right at the door. Exactly. What was he implying right there? The implication. He could step through that door of heaven at any moment and, and catch you up, you know, uh, from the earth. And you'd be embarrassed <clears throat> if you were involved in sin. Right. And again, John in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, uh, said to believers, uh, you better keep yourself in right relationship spiritually with the Lord because he could come at any moment and snatch you up and you'll be face to face with him, and you, you want to not be embarrassed at his coming, what you were doing uh, whenever he came, and, and et cetera. So that, again, that's an imminency passage. He could come at any moment, and so every moment of every day, you better be careful in your relationship with the Lord Jesus, because the next moment you may be face to face with him. So on the rapture, there are no signs, nothing that has to happen before Jesus comes at the rapture. He could come any moment. Okay? But guys, I want you to look at this list that we're given of what must take place, according to Matthew 24, before Jesus returns to earth. Let me just read them, and I want you to pick out the ones that really strike you. Matthew 24, 4 through 28. Number one, many shall come in my name and deceive many. Number two, wars and rumors of war, nations against nation. Maybe, Jimmy, you want to talk about that one. Three, famines in the world. Four, pestilences or plagues. Fifth, earthquakes. Uh, six, they will kill Christians. Seven, many shall betray one another. Eight, false prophets shall deceive many. Nine, the love of many will grow cold. Ten, the gospel shall be preached in all the world. Eleven, abomination of desolation shall take place. People will flee Jerusalem. There will be uh, more false Christs, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, we're going to see cosmic signs. The sun will be dark, and the moon will not give its light. Stars will fall from the sky, and then they will see the Son of Man coming, the Bible says. What, Jimmy, signs in that list talk to you? Let me talk about two of them. He said there in Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7, that there will be wars and rumors of wars. See, ye be not dismayed, the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, I was speaking on that particular subject at a church in Columbus, Georgia. Now, Columbus, Georgia is a military town. And, and during my message, I said there are 53 wars going on in our world today. Now, I thought that was a very outstanding statement. But when I concluded the message, a colonel came up to me. He was in the United States Army. And he said, Dr. DeYoung, I'm going to have to correct you. I said, well, what did I say wrong, sir? 
Well, he then told me that he had just graduated from the War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. That's where they take the line officers and train them for having to go to war. And he said those people who know the facts told him there were 157 wars going on in our world today. I was just about a third of what's really happening. When you look at the Middle East, the entire continent of Africa is in war. You come into the Gaza Strip, uh, there's Fatah and Hamas, two factions of the Palestinians. They're at war with each other. There's almost to be a civil war in Israel among the Jewish people because those living in the Jewish settlements say they're not coming out and the government says we're going to have to evacuate you. They're ready to go to war. And I probably don't have to expand much farther in the rest of the Middle Eastern nations. Iran getting ready to attack, try to destroy Israel, a coalition of nations coming together. So that's that particular aspect of some of the signs Jesus was talking about. And he did this about 2,000 years ago. Then in verse 15 of Matthew 24, I think this may well be one of the most outstanding signs of the fact that uh, we're close to the tribulation period. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee, get out of Jerusalem. Now, the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, walks into the temple, going into the Holy of Holies, and he claims to be God. That is the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. But there must be something that happens before he can walk into the Holy of Holies. There has to be a temple there. And there is no temple there. But I'm here to tell you, and I've searched this through for 25 years, done a lot of investigation, met with all the personalities, watched all the projects going on. And they're ready to build that temple. They have 28,000 men who have, in their estimation, qualified to be priests and trained to be priests. Uh, they have the high priest selected. I talked to him, this rabbi in the old city of Jerusalem. I asked him, I said, what about the Sanhedrin? I heard the Sanhedrin has been reformed. Is that correct? He said, yes. I said, how do you know? He said, I'm the chairman of the Sanhedrin. <laughs> I thought that kind of proved the point. Uh, I said, what about the priestly garments? I understand you were the first one who received your priestly garment. He said, Jimmy, it's hanging in my closet. All I have to do is go in, put it on, report to the Temple Mount for duty. They have 4,000 harps that have been made. They know where the Ark of the Covenant is, according to Scripture, but according to investigation. They have a red heifer that's ready. I mean, I could go on and on, the preparations for building that temple. Now, that temple must be on the Temple Mount during that tribulation period for the Antichrist to perform the abomination of desolation. I think those two wars and the temple are outstanding evidences of how we are in that time. Yeah, the, the point that we're making is that the Bible's pointing out that certain things, events, signs are going to be apparent to us and they're all going to take place, all of them, before Jesus will return to earth. But a, the rapture says nothing. Right. They've got to be two separate events. They can't be the same event because it wouldn't make sense. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get into this absolutely astonishing topic of the Battle of Armageddon. You've heard people in the news use this. You've heard it referred to all kinds of things. What does the Bible actually say will happen during the tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon? And what's Jesus going to do? Stick with us. We'll talk about that when we come right back. If you would like to have all of the information in today's series entitled, One Coming or Two, The Eight Differences Between the Rapture and the Second Coming, the five television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $49 and come as both a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. And you may order these programs now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Jimmy DeYoung. We're talking with Dr. Renal Showers. And Jimmy, I want to come to you. The Bible talks about the Battle of Armageddon. Everybody has taken that word and used it to apply to all kinds of situations that it really doesn't apply to. 
and I want to know what does the Bible say is going to happen up ahead. John, let me use the term the campaign of Armageddon instead of the battle of Armageddon. And the reason I say that, Armageddon means the Mount of Megiddo, which is at the head of the Jezreel Valley, where all the death is going to take place in this campaign of Armageddon. But when you go to the Bible, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2, we see that all the nations of the world are going to be gathered at Jerusalem. So this campaign really begins in Jerusalem. How do they all come to Jerusalem? When you go to Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 to 16, it's talking about how Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet will do signs, wonders, and miracles to gather all the kings of the earth and their armies to Jerusalem. By the way, that's another evidence of the signs we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. that'll happen during that tribulation period. Signs, wonders, and miracles, and we have a proliferation of them today. Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet will use these signs, wonders, and miracles to gather everybody into Jerusalem. At the point in time that this happens, when they start raping the women in the city of Jerusalem, when they start destroying the city, God in the heavenlies is going to tell His Son Jesus to come back to the earth. You see in chapter 19, verse 11 in the book of Revelation, that Jesus mounts His white horse. In verse 14 it says, the armies in the heaven, that would be you and I, or Christians who were raptured out of this world, we come back with Christ back to the city of Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, we come back and we step down on the Mount of Olives. Now, a number of things are going to happen, but the text there in Zechariah says the mountain, the Mount of Olives, will split making way for a valley to lead up to the Valley of the Mountains. If you've ever been to Israel, you stand in the Jezreel Valley, which is a thousand square miles, 13 miles wide, 67 miles long, and you have to understand that is the Valley of the Mountains. Behind you, if you're looking to the north, you see the mountains of Nazareth, Mount Tabor, Mount Moray, over to the east, Mount Gilboa going down the Jezreel Valley. Over to the left, out to the west, you have the mountains of Carmel. So this Jezreel Valley is surrounded by the mountains. Napoleon said it's the most strategic battlefield in all the world because you can fight in the daytime in that thousand square miles, bivouac on the slopes of the mountains in the evening, re-strategize and come to fight again. Well, Jesus Christ, when He lands in the city of Jerusalem and all these armies that are gathered there, and I would say very conservatively that that would be about 100 million soldiers. Uh, the United Nations says there's 197 nations. I'm taking that by half a hundred nations and a million soldiers apiece. They make their way up to the Jezreel Valley. Jesus Christ, He's going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. It's eight and a half square miles. It'll be 2,500 square miles. He rebuilds the Temple Mount. It's about three football fields in size. It'll be a mile square. He builds a temple on that Temple Mount, and then He goes up to the Jezreel Valley. There the Bible tells us in chapter 19, He speaks. I mean, it's not going to be a nuclear war. He speaks and they die. Chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, it talks about in verses 19 and 20 that the blood of the flow is high as the horse's bridle. And many people ask me, do I think that's literal? But wait a minute, I very conservatively estimated 100 million soldiers. That's 600 million quarts of blood. You do the numbers and that blood's going to flow 176 miles. That's about 50 quarts of blood for every foot. Once that battle of Armageddon has been completed and Jesus wipes out all the enemies under the leadership of Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet. He goes, by the way, 176 miles from the Jezreel Valley to the place called Petra where he has protected his Jewish people for a number of years during that tribulation period from the persecution. He then travels through the Jordan Valley up the backside of the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, up through the Eastern Gates, goes into the temple, into the Holy of Holies. And there he sits down as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jimmy, I've had people that have gotten our DVDs of programs in the past, and they have left them out and gone to the store. And some of their unsaved relatives have said, I wonder what those Christians believe about prophecy. They've played the DVD, and they have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by watching. For those that might have picked this up just to hear what it's all about, the key thing we want them to understand is these events are what God is saying, 
but He has sent Jesus to be our Savior. He wants to love us. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And he's, Jesus shed His blood so we could have the forgiveness of our sins. Advise the person that's listening right now that hasn't done anything about that, maybe just has some knowledge. What do they need to do right now as they listen? You know, the book of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 says, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The entire book of Revelation, all of Bible prophecy, lifts up Jesus. And that's the one that we want to point you to today because they need to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What we've been describing in that terrible time of tribulation, the seven years, is not going to be a time when anybody wants to be alive. Now, it's, some people say, well, is this an escape valve for you to get out of the trouble? Yes, it is. And praise God, it is. He has given me the opportunity to receive Himself, Jesus Christ, the one lifted up in Bible prophecy, who came to wash away all the sin. He died on a cross. Three days later, He resurrected from the dead. His death on the cross, when He shed His blood, washed me clean of sin. But when He resurrected from the dead, He guaranteed He was the one qualified to do that. Now that being the case, and we're lifting up Jesus, you need to accept what He says. You have to admit you're a sinner before a pure, perfect, holy God. He set the standard. He sent His Son to take care of the problem of sin. You have to trust in Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. And then as all of us have, you have to call upon Him to come into your heart and life and save you. That's what needs to be done before all of this other stuff begins. Yeah, and folks, as I've always said, if you will call, God makes a promise to you. Whosoever, put your name there, shall call upon the name of the Lord. How do you do that? You pray. In your own words, you tell the Lord that you're a sinner. You recognize Jesus as the Savior and you want Him to save you, to forgive your sins, to come into your life, to change you, to empower you. We can't live the Christian life on our own power. So, we invite Christ to come in. He starts to change us. And it starts when you invite Christ into your life. And that's what I'd like you to do right now. And if you do, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, not might be, not hope to, if God gets around to it, but when you pray and you ask Him sincerely, God says, shall be saved. And He'll do it for you. And I'd ask you to do it right now. So next week, we're going to talk about the second coming of Christ. What happens after the battle of Armageddon and the second coming actually takes place? What does Jesus do? We're also going to continue talking about the differences that the Bible gives us about the rapture and the second coming, the things that happen that are different in these accounts. So I hope that you'll join us then. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, One Coming or Two, The Eight Differences Between the Rapture and the Second Coming, Why the Rapture and the Second Coming are not the same event, but two different events separated by the seven-year tribulation period, Why the Rapture is an imminent event in which Jesus could come back at any moment, while the Second Coming is not an imminent event, but must be preceded by the seven years of tribulation on the earth. You will also learn eight different things that the Bible teaches will happen at the rapture that will not happen at the second coming, and eight different things that will occur at the second coming that will not occur at the rapture. In addition, after the rapture, what does the Bible say about the Antichrist, a powerful new political leader who will arise and persuade the world to follow his ideas? What will he do? And at the Battle of Armageddon, what will happen? And which nations will be involved? And when Jesus returns to the earth at the second coming, what will happen? And what will he do? The five television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $49 and come as both a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. Then we are making available a second series called Step by Step Through the Rapture with Dr. Renal Showers and Dr. Jimmy DeYoung. All four television programs in this series are available for a gift of $49. 
In this series, you will learn where the Bible teaches that a whole generation of believers around the world will be taken in mass into God's presence at the time of the rapture, and that they will never know what it is to die physically. How Jesus made a comparison between Jewish marriage customs in his own day and his coming to receive his bride, the church, at the rapture in John chapter 14 and what the Bible teaches will happen after the rapture and why events in the world today are rapidly leading us toward the alliance of nations the ancient prophet Ezekiel predicted will come against Israel in the last days. The four television programs in Step by Step Through the Rapture are available on DVD for a gift of $49 and come as both a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. Then third, we are making available two new study guides with extensive notes that parallel our two television series. Each study guide is available for a gift of $8 or for five or more copies for $5 each. And finally, if you would like to have all of these items together, that is both TV series containing nine television programs, plus the two study guides, all four of these items are available together in a special package for only $99. And you may order this special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may also order these materials at our website at jashow.org Now folks, during this series we're also making available our Ultimate Prophecy Package which features 17 prophecy scholars, over 40 television programs, 6 study guides, and about 24 hours of content. And my guests on these television series include Prime Minister of Israel Benjamin Netanyahu, retired 3-star General William G. Boykin, Dr. David Jeremiah, Zola Levitt, Dr. Tim LaHaye, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, Dr. David Breeze, Dr. John Walvoord, and many others. All 40 television programs in the Ultimate Prophecy Package are available now for a gift of only $100. And you may order it by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. Now as we close today, here are some scenes from next week's program. And so Jesus Christ is going to return this earth to the way it was when He created it back there in Genesis chapter 1. 